Good afternoon. It's 101 Eastern. Welcome to Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. Uh, I'm Sam Gill, your host. Uh, a tacit undercurrent of this turbulent year has been a perennial issue in American democracy, which is the question of how free we are to express ourselves. It's implicit when we confront issues like quarantine protesters. They can protest, but should they? And would the health risk justify some kind of intervention? What about the protests about race still ongoing in many American cities? When does protest, the right to assemble, cross a line that warrants a response, a response sadly that is all too often militarized, if ever? Are there views we do not need to hear or that are downright harmful, as some alleged during the controversy at the New York Times over an op-ed by U.S. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, a controversy that ultimately cost op-ed page editor James Bennett his job? And an especially hot issue, what are we allowed to say online? Should platforms allow any speech, even if it's a lie or misleading, even if that misinformation comes from the US president? Some of these questions impl Im implicate the First Amendment to our Constitution, which guarantees five freedoms of thought and expression, the right to believe what you wish, the right to speak what you wish, the rights of a free press, the right to peaceful assembly, and the right to petition the government. But some of these questions have less to do with the law of free speech and more with its spirit. They are about how we as a society weigh the benefit of being able to speak up and out against the costs that such expression might have on others. Today's guest is one of the great scholars on the issues of First Amendment and free expression. Jeffrey Stone is a law professor at the University of Chicago, where he was formerly dean. And he has literally written the book on freedom in times of crisis twice over with 2004's Perilous Times, Free Speech in Wartime, in 2007's War and Liberty, an American Dilemma. It is my great pleasure today to welcome to the show, Jeffrey Stone. Welcome. Delighted to be here. Thank you for joining us. So I, uh, I, I sort of want to jump right into it. I mean, you have written about free speech and, and freedom in times of crisis. And sort of before we get to the specifics of today, what are some of the big themes that you found in your research? Well, there's a tendency pretty important tendency um, on the part of government to overreact in periods of perceived crisis, and particularly to take advantage of the opportunity to silence those who are critical of the people in power. And we saw that with the Sedition Act of 1798, um, when the government acted legislation that prohibited individuals from criticizing the government. During the Civil War, the Lincoln administration shut down hundreds of newspapers uh, during World War I, the Wilson administration passed the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, which again made it a crime to criticize the war or the draft or the administration. During the communist era, the McCarthy era, we saw the government fearing uh, communist intrusion into American democracy, shut down a broad range of, of individuals who were seen as supporting communism. So one thing we know is that there is a sense when there is a crisis or a perceived crisis, on the part of those in positions of authority to want to shut down speech that they see as potentially harmful to the nation or to themselves. And it's important to note that typically this happens when they're shutting down people whose views are critical of them. And they're therefore using this in part be because they're trying to forest forestall danger in a time of crisis, but also because they want to silence their critics. And those two things get conflated in these circumstances. And what are, did you, were there any, you know, you've, you've named, um, e even in the examples, the notable examples you've given, there are, our, our own audience is probably thinking, well, I'm a little more sympathetic to some of those encroachments on liberty, and I'm a little less sympathetic to some of the other ones. You've, you know, McCarthyism sort of notoriously arbitrary uh, in, 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 is perceived that way, whereas um, some of the Civil War uh, uh, and World War II encroachments, you know, our, our audience may have an intuitive sense, right, that there was the national security interests, the goals were paramount. Did you, did you, have you determined in your research sort of better ways of assessing, you know, when that state interest is really uh, compelling versus when that state interest is, is, um, is just about reducing <laughs> friction in the system that leaders don't want? I think what the Supreme Court has learned over time and I agree with this, is that we have to be extremely skeptical about government efforts to silence uh, critics, even in times of crisis. Because at the moment, it may seem like a reasonable thing to do. But with the benefit of hindsight, 
it becomes clear that it was not as necessary as it was perceived and that the motivations for doing it frequently had much more to do with political power and, 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 and continuing to be in political power than with the nation's interest. And so what the court has done is go from a position in which initially it basically said, if the government has a legitimate justification, we will defer to the government's decisions to a position now where the court says, unless you can show a, a clear and present danger of grave harm, we will not allow the government to silence speech, even in times of crisis. And I think that's basically proved to be the right approach. How have, how have you been thinking about these issues, you know, this year? Because we've had, we've had two kinds of state interest issues that have come up around expression this year. First, there were a series of protests, um, you know, principally kind of from the right, from sort of an anti-establishment populist crowd on the right that, that was skeptical of some of the stay-at-home orders um, uh, as a question of liberty and then took to the streets in some cases to protest them. And then, of course, in May, after the killing of George Floyd, we had um, we have and have an ongoing series of protests happening in American cities where there have been state interests both about health uh, and, and the transmissibility of the virus, but then also sort of the typical kind of state concern about, you know, about, about anxiety about when protest is perceived to no longer be, to no longer be peaceful, uh, peaceful protest. How have you been thinking about, about those issues in the context of what you've studied and uh, with regard to free speech? Well, the interesting question here is that these situations raise, um, at least from the standpoint of First Amendment doctrine, a very different question than the ones, of the, than the examples I gave earlier. Because here we're talking about regulations that A, are not necessarily addressed at speech at all. That is basically the government states and, and cities and so on have adopted policies that prohibited people, uh, at least in the earlier stages of COVID, um, from being in public without social distancing and without wearing masks. And the concern was that if people gathered together um, and particularly were not wearing masks, they posed a serious health risk to themselves and ultimately to others. And that was not even about speech. That was about going to the beach. That was about you know, going to baseball games. Um, and the impact on speech was incidental. And in that situation, the basic approach is to say, would give much more deference to the government because they're not trying to restrict the communication of particular messages. And indeed, they're not even trying to restrict speech necessarily. The application of those regulations of social distancing and masks has only an incidental effect on speech. It would apply to baseball games and to the beaches and so on, without regard to whether somebody was engaging in speech. And therefore, the reasons to be skeptical from a First Amendment standpoint are much less than they are when the government directly is regulating speech or is directly targeting a particular message of speech. So, that, so the first issue there is how do you think about that from a First Amendment perspective? And generally, the court has taken the view that when a law has only an incidental effect on speech, that the government gets a high degree of deference. And it's not absolute. There are circumstances where the impact on speech is sufficiently serious that the government has to show a very substantial or even a compelling justification for doing it. But the starting point is basically that um, if the government is not att attempting to restrict speech, then the fact that the law has an effect on speech uh, does not raise a serious First Amendment question, except in unusual circumstances. Let me, so let's, let's drill down that a little bit more though, because, um, you know, one of, one of the things I got, so like I got my hair cut a few weeks ago and I, I joked, the, this is the, this is the first time that, that I, that getting a haircut was a political speech act, you know, in my, in my lifetime, I had to think about the politics of it. We had a great, a question from the audience just now that I, that, that is on this, which is at some point, I think we're already seeing this, but at some point it's theoretically possible that someone will say, I, my not wearing a mask is a political statement that I'm making against what I see as a tyrannical government that's trying to constrain our liberty in other ways. And given the kinds of polarization that we're now experiencing, I mean, what, what is bringing people to protest in the first place? This is, if this isn't already happening, it's, it's likely to start, you know, schools, you know, universities will come back. And I'm sure there will be students who say, this is a form of protest against what the university is doing. So putting aside that, you know, private universities, it's a different system. 
imagine this in a public context that someone is going again, you know, it's a public university, let's say someone is, I'm not going to follow this rule. I, I believe this is a form of tyranny. Would you assess that sort of intentional act differently uh, as a jurist? So again, the way the court has, the Supreme Court has analyzed these questions um, is illustrated by the draft card burning case. Okay. So in a case called O'Brien v. United States, uh, an individual burned a draft card to, to protest against the Vietnam War. And he was prosecuted and convicted for violating a law that prohibited any, prohibited any person knowingly to destroy a draft card. And the government's argument about the reason for the law had nothing to do with burning draft cards as opposition to the Vietnam War. It was that if you were eligible for the draft, it was important that you have a draft card in your possession. Think about driver's licenses, right? And the government's concern, arguably, was that you needed the draft card in your possession because if you were subject to the draft, and if there was an emergency, you'd need to look at the draft card and know what number to call to contact your draft card, your draft board. Or if you were stopped by an authority who said, are you really um, not supposed to be in uniform, you could show them your draft card which showed that you were, um, you were immune from the draft or, or whatever. And so the court upheld the, the, the prohibition and held that O'Brien who burned a draft card to express his opposition to the draft in a protest against the Vietnam War could be punished for doing so. And the, re the reason again was that the law was in the court's view not directed at speech it had only an incidental effect on speech. So if somebody speeds on a highway and then says, I was protesting speed limits, right? Or if somebody uh, decides to bathe nude and says, well, I was protesting laws against nudity. Every law can be challenged by people who maintain that my reason for violating the law was to express my opposition. And so the court's been very reluctant to open that door. Right. And that's my, that's my usual strategy when I get in trouble with the law. But I, but I, uh, but, but I, I didn't put my recycling out as a statement against recycling, but no, but, but I, so I, and I think that makes sense. I mean, I think the COVID issues, it's funny actually, because I don't think there's anyone right now accusing stay at home orders or besides this small group as some sort of instrumentality of like a, of, of, of an overly aggressive, right? It's the opposite actually, right? Like most people are really frustrated that there isn't sort of more state control in some cases over, over our action. But there's, um, but there's a, a more complicated issue that is starting to come up that I kind of want to turn to now, which is, um, which is sort of the question about um, the harm that speech engenders and some shifting about the sensibility about uh, the material harm that speech can cause. I know this has been a big topic on campuses uh, around around speech with regard to race and identity, um, wh you know, whether it's debates about trigger warnings, um, whether it's debates about restricting certain kinds of, uh, of identity of identity based speech. Um, I think, as I alluded to in the top of the show, a part there was a lot about the Tom Cotton op ed that was about the process that was followed, but fundamentally, I think there was an argument here that said, we, not only do we not need this view, it's arguably a harmful view. And that the zone of acceptable speech is maybe shifting away from this as a, as a mainstream view. So I'd love, to, I'd love to talk a little bit about that. I guess my first question would be, you're on a campus. You know, Our polling shows that um, young people continue to affirm the value of free speech, but also really acutely affirm values of diversity and inclusion. And I'd be interested, you know, what you're seeing and experiencing both as a scholar and as an educator. Well, I think that the, the conflict between the values of free speech in an academic environment in particular, and the concerns about equality and fairness is a legitimate conflict. And I think those are both legitimate values to be concerned about. But in a university in particular, I think it is especially important that individuals be allowed to advocate for any ideas that they think should be considered. And silencing ideas because they are wrong or undesirable or, or hurtful or painful is a very dangerous thing to do in an academy. If you look back at our history, Again, um, we would not have had an effective civil rights movement if people in the South had been allowed to completely silence that movement because they thought the ideas that were being expressed, accusing them of being racists, were completely offensive. Or a women's rights movement would never have taken place if 
majorities with power were able to silence that because they thought those ideas were just ridiculous, inappropriate, and made no sense at all. Um, gay rights movement would never have occurred. So one of the things that I think we have to be aware of is not trusting ourselves to exercise the power of censorship wisely. That if we look back over our own history, what we can see is that it's essential to allow people to express views that the majority may find wrongheaded or hurtful or unpleasant because those views may turn out to be right. And we should not be making definitive decisions about that for the future. But Lots of things we believe today, I am confident, our children and our children's children will look back on and say, how could they have believed that to be true? And it's important that we, have, that we be open to ideas, even ideas that we find uh, re repulsive, because we may turn out to be wrong. What, though, thinking about some of the cases that have come up, though, right, it, 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 it they're not always cases where um, a student, say, is forwarding a view that, like, I, let's say I consider racially retrograde through, you know, elocution and reason and, uh, and, an, and an argument at some length. I think some of the cases that we see coming up are where, um, where students who, uh, uh, students of color, in, in many cases, students of color who are very much in the minority, even beyond sort of population proportionate levels at the university, uh, lower income students who maybe if they're, fir they're the first generation to be uh, getting a college education are, uh, are, are in the vicinity of, you know, racial epithets um, that are, that may be tossed out thoughtlessly or intentionally, or are in situations where they may reasonably feel, um, I, I, we, I'm not entering this as an equal to that other person, and we've got two views being pitted at each other. I'm walking into this at a disadvantage. I'm walking into this on the other side of power instrumentalized against me, and this person has all of that, right? And we call it privilege. How do you, what do you think about those situations? They may not, it may not be within the purview of what First Amendment doctrine can tell us, but it's certainly within the purview of some, what some of our values about what expression should do, certainly. I think there are two, at least two responses to that completely legitimate concern that universities should take. Uh, one of them is to be aware of that reality and to take steps to assist individuals who are feeling as if they are outsiders, um, to, uh, to deal with those concerns, uh, to give them opportunities to strengthen their own confidence in their ability to be effective members of the community and to pay serious attention to that in a, in a positive way. I think universities have learned that's much more important than they realized in the past. Um, when I was a student, there were many fewer uh, persons of color, for example, in uh, our classes. And I've gone back in the last year or two and talked to some of the students I had uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago um, and asked them, did you feel at various times as if you were being insulted or degraded either by other students or by faculty members? And they said, yeah, damn right I did. And I said, did you say anything about it? And they said, no, if I had done that at the time, I would have been looked at, it would have been terrible. And one of the things that's happened over time is partly because we've, we have increased the diversity in the academic community is students have become much more confident about their ability to speak out and raise these issues. And that's been really educational for other students and for faculty members and for the institutions. And I think they have paid uh, attention to how, to how to address that in, in constructive ways. The other thing I think universities have to do is to encourage civility and mutual respect. That's part of the educational process and to recognize that you don't want to be insulting and, and um, intimidating other people. That's not an appropriate way of engaging in academic discourse and dialogue. And so one of the things I think it's important to do is to make students aware of the fact that an important value is not only freedom of speech, but it's also the fact that you respect other people and you recognize that things you're saying can be destructive in ways you don't understand and to be aware of that, learn that lesson, and learn to make your points in a way that are, are not needlessly harmful and hurtful. But let, so let's actually continue to go down this line of thinking to another, 
another kind of environment where the questions of exp expression broadly are coming up, which is in, a, in an employment context, right? So, so I think there, there is an argument that has new purchase um, in the way, particularly in this moment of reckoning, right? Which is that even well-intentioned codes of professional practice that have implications for speech in a private employment context um, and well-intentioned codes of civility, there is an argument now being sustained, right? That those two are instruments, if not malevolent, are sort of instruments of power uh, and repression about certain views. So like we have an example, one of the, one of the our viewers asked a question, which is, you know, newsrooms broadly discourage employees from openly airing their political views in order to, for a good reason, right? Which is that our, our audience, our ideologically diverse audience should perceive that we're telling the story quote straight. And there's a substantive argument, as you know, being advanced, right, which is we're not telling the story straight if we're not actually sort of speaking truth to power about some really fundamental issues with regard to, to race in this country. Um, do you, what, what, should we be rethinking, you know, what kinds of, um, what kinds of, of, of restrictions employers can impose on employees in a, in a world where these pretty elemental values oriented arguments are being made against such restrictions? So one interesting thing is that the civil rights acts in this country, certainly the federal civil rights acts, um, prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, religion, gender, and sex, and so on. But they don't prohibit discrimination on the basis of political beliefs. And I've always wondered about why that's the case. Um, that is, employers are allowed, if they want to, to fire people if they are supporters of Donald Trump, or if they are supporters of Joe Biden. And I've never understood why civil rights laws do not prohibit that kind of discrimination, but they don't. And I think part of the notion, which I don't agree with necessarily, is that employers should have the freedom to decide what the political views of their employees are in their particular um, business. And I, I, don't, I do think that constraints on that are appropriate. Um, and uh, in, in the academic environment or in the, in the journalist environment, um, I think that uh, newspapers should be free to decide for themselves um, what positions they want to take and what they mean by professionalism in terms of the, the, the types of columns or, or editorials that they want people to write. Um, because those people are working directly to express the views of the, of the organization. Um, so in, in, a, in a journalist context, I think, I think it's, a, it's appropriate for an organization like the Wall Street Journal to have its own set of views that it wants to express, or Fox News to express the views they want to express, and MSNBC or the Washington Post to do that. So there, I, I don't find that as problematic. I do think that they should be balanced as a general matter. But it's also the case that the idea is we have a wide range of these entities, and some of them take some positions, and some of them take other positions. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Right. And then you don't, and I suppose along that line, I mean, I think there were, are plenty who would disagree, but you don't have to accept the implied neutrality of the employer, which I, I think is, a, if not a pernicious belief, is just, is just not plausible, I think, to a, a young generation. This does raise a question for me, and is I want to start talking a bit about online, but before I get there, you know, as a scholar of the First Amendment, to what extent is, is the legal doctrine around the First Amendment a leading indicator versus a lagging indicator? Because I think this is a good example where, irrespective of what you or I may think is appropriate from a juridical perspective, it's clear to me like a younger generation of employees just isn't going to tolerate a working environment, at least in the knowledge workspace, that, that doesn't allow probably broader parameters around not only acceptable, but to some extent encouraged political speech. Uh, I look at the way some of the tech companies are reeling, frankly, as their employee bases start to speak out in direct disagreement with company policy. Um, how, does, does, do you find the law sort of responds to the evolution of society or is ahead of and shows the way it, when it comes to First Amendment? Well, both. Um, uh, I think that, that law in, in constitutional terms um, can both evolve over time as social attitudes evolve, as judges learn um, from experience and from the experience of the people generally. Uh, but at the same time, there are lots of instances in which the, the law or the courts um, can lead and can move people 
So a Brown v. Board of Education is a good right. example um, of the courts going much further than the people in the third of the states at that time wanted to go. And it was appropriate, I think, for the courts to take that role. Or Roe v. Wade is another example. Um, so there are plenty of examples where I think the, the courts uh, evolve partly because social attitudes have changed. Uh, the court would not have decided Brown v. Board of Education, education that way in 1920, and it wouldn't have cited Roe v. Wade the way it did in 1920. So part of, or, or also gay rights, for example, they would not have decided that way 50 years earlier. But at the same time, the courts can lead because their own understandings of social values and aspirations are informed by evolution of, of, of attitudes among the public. So in, in many of the court's most important decisions, it is both, the justice is both learning from social change. And again, cases like Brown and Roe and uh, Obergefell are great examples of that, but they're also ahead of the curve. Um, they're also requiring the society to move in a direction in which many citizens in many states would not yet uh, embrace. So, so let's talk kind of as a, a final area of discussion around one of the places where certainly kind of events are racing ahead and, and, and policy and, and mores are struggling to keep up, which is, of course, online speech. And, you know, even though you know, these, are, these, are, these are, of course, private platforms with their own standards of conduct, I think they're also increasingly dominant public squares where a lot, a lot of social, political, and, and commercial discourse is, is happening, where the you know, impacts uh, on our other basic institutions are, are real, where some of those institutions are, you know, use these channels uh, in, order to, in order to speak, and where it strikes me that kind of the qualities of speech are in some cases the same as offline, but in other cases quite different, right? The, the megaphone can be louder, the intensity of the experience, I often think about, you know, one of the things our polling has shown is young people, when they think about speech, are thinking a lot about the digital experience, where the experience of having 15,000 people criticize you is different than five people criticizing you. Um, and as, as some of your, you know, other legal scholars like Marianne Franks or Danielle Citron have observed, the internet has the unusual quality of converting a lot of acts into speech. You know, they kind of come out in the form of expression uh, on, online. I'd love to. I'd love to know. Um, first of all, you know what you think about a really dominant debate now, which is that you have a president who's actually saying, "I think I'm being censored online," and that this is this is wrong. He's not alone. A number of other, particularly leading conservative thinkers, have made this made this accusation. But what have you what have you made of this sort of the use of that term that this is about sort of censorship uh, online? Well, I, I mean, I, first of all, I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence to support the proposition that the president's being censored online. Um, the fact that there are a, a small number of instances where Twitter or whatever has, has said, you know, maybe this is not a true statement, is not the same thing as being censored online. Um, I, I think the challenge of social media is a really difficult one. Um, initially, the government took the view that we don't want social media platforms to be under a legal obligation to censor what gets put on their platforms. Um, a newspaper like the New York Times or the Washington Post um, can be held liable if it publishes a, an article that libels someone. Um, and that's partly because they, they control exactly what they publish. They make decisions about it. It's a limited amount of material. They decide what they're going to publish. When social media came into existence, um, Congress decided that it's, it's not at all realistic to expect entities that didn't exist yet, but like Facebook and Twitter, to be held liable for everything that I put up or you put up um, on their platform that might be actionable because it's libelous or obscene or whatever. Because that, that, there's billions of things being put up. And there's no realistic way that they could monitor all of this in a credible manner. And if they did so, they would have enormous power. And so what Section 230 of the Communications Act was meant to do was to basically say, you're not like the New York Times. You're not going to be held liable because somebody puts up something on your social media platform that happens to be defamatory or that happens to be obscene or whatever. Um, they may be liable for having put it up, but... Facebook and, and Twitter are not going to be liable. 
So one thing Congress did was to insulate them from any liability and basically say, this is a, like a public forum. And it didn't prohibit them from censoring, but it said you're not liable if somebody puts something up that is otherwise actionable. The question now is whether they should, in fact, be engaging in screening and removal of material. There are good reasons for that because some of the material that gets put up there is in fact inappropriate and actionable. Um, but on the other hand, the question is, do we want to trust a private entity like Facebook or Twitter to engage in censorship of what material goes up? And once they begin to do that, how do we know they're not gonna then turn political? and then begin allowing things that advocate some positions and taking down things that advocate other positions and therefore having an even more distorting effect on American politics. So this is, I think, a very challenging issue as we go forward. Um, to, to require these entities to remove material is extremely difficult because there are billions of things being put up every day and how can we really expect them to screen everything? Um, and on the other hand, to encourage them to take down things runs the risk that they will abuse that power and that they will begin, if they're pro-Trump, taking down things that criticize Trump. And if they're anti-Trump, taking down things that, that are, are pro-Trump. Um, and do we really want Facebook and Twitter acting in that way? So the idea of neutrality served legitimate concerns, but it's also the case that a lot of stuff that gets put up is wrong, is false, is misleading, and should we have some way of, of addressing that? Right now, I think we haven't figured out the answer to that question. What are, I mean, what are some, I, I, I won't put you on the spot and say, how would you solve the problem? Because I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair and I, we don't, I don't know. know the answer. But, right. but I'm interested in how you'd move the debate forward, right? Because I think there's, I think two <laughs> of the pressure points that come up are, are, are one, even those who might be ambivalent, there are, there are those who are ambivalent about, um, empowering the companies to censor, but who will also acknowledge that they sort of are now anyway, right? They, they will respond to political pressure. They will, there's an arbitrariness now that e leaves even certain real sort of free speech maximalists, I would say, uh, uncomfortable. Um, and then there's sort of a second line of argument, right? Which is that, um, the, that, that neutrality has, because, because the harm is not neutrally distributed, neutrality has a non-neutral effect, right? Because we now know that Russian state interference disproportionately targeted black Americans. Implied neutrality has a non-neutral effect because you treat accurate and misleading information the same way you end up privileging misinformation. And so are there, are there kinds of questions that you think are the ones we should start to focus on if we want to find our way through this thicket? I mean, I think what you just raised is, is exactly right. I mean, the problem is that having Facebook and Twitter and similar social platforms, social media platforms, not intervene, runs risks of creating harm to discourse in our society. On the other hand, empowering them to intervene and putting pressure on them to intervene raises very serious risks in the other direction, that they will do so in a way that is not neutral. And the more you empower them to do this, the greater that risk becomes. So the question is, is there some sensible, neutral way of doing this? Now, one way to do it is to create a government entity like the old Federal Communications Commission, mm -hmm. which um, regulated radio and television and that oversees social media and to, it, to see if we can create an entity that does it in a responsible and fair-minded way and that reviews the takedown processes to ensure that they are consistent with the set of standards that are articulated. But, um, you know, I don't think we're living in the same world today that we lived in when the Fairness Doctrine was in place. Um, and so I don't know that we can trust government entities to do this. So it's, I don't think there's a simple solution. It's a real dilemma. Um, and I, I don't, think there's, I don't think there's a simple solution. I do think we need to address it. And I do think we need to spend time on it. I think we are. I think there are lots of organizations and uh, academics and, and, and members of the journalistic world who are spending lots of energy thinking about how to get at this. But I don't think they've come to a satisfactory solution yet. 
but it's a great challenge for the future. What do you, so let's kind of end on, on that note, thinking about the future. You, what are, you know, if you had to kind of boil down to a theme or, 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 or a set of ideas, sort of what the last century was for freedom of speech, freedom of expression, what, what would it be? And as you look ahead at the century we are now, a fifth of the way through, you know, what do you think will be the, what, what is this century for free speech? What is, what is going to be the coming theme or themes? So the last century was a learning experience. It was an experience in which we went from having virtually no legal or social understanding or concept of free speech to one in which we de developed a very speech protective and pretty sophisticated set of principles about the importance of free speech, the dangers of allowing government to intervene in the realm of free speech, and um, basically trusting individual citizens to listen, to read, to learn, and to come to their own conclusions about what's right and what's wrong. Um, and I think that was a great achievement, um, led by the courts in particular. Um, in this century, I think there is a concern about, is there such a thing as too much free speech? And um, do we need more government intervention than we now have? Because the opportunities for manipulation and for misleading uh, have grown much greater as, with changes in technology. And also, I think it's an educational issue. I mean, I, I, I think that, that we are not doing a very good job of educating young people today to the importance of free speech and how to deal with the dangers of free speech and how to think about them and how to think about American political systems and how to think about civics. And I think that was a much more central part of education if you go back to the 20th century than it is today where a lot more is about STEM. And I think therefore we've created a generation of, of, of individuals who are much less aware of, much less thoughtful about the history, about the dangers, about the values of free speech than they were at the end of the 20th century. Um, and I think that's something we should pay much more attention to in our educational process. I think we've lost sight of that. And we've so much more of our focus is educating kids about, about STEM type issues than about civics and governance. Uh, and I think it's a real problem for democracy. And you actually, you mentioned before the show that you actually teach an undergraduate class on First Amendment free speech. Do you, is that something you think, let's not say it should be required, but is that something you think ought to be offered, you know, at most universities? Is there, are you getting that kind of response from the students? Absolutely. I think, I think it should be. Um, and in high schools as well, I think it should be. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agreed to teach this First Amendment course, free speech course to undergraduates in part because I think that it's, it's become much more relevant, much more important uh, than it was 25, 30 years ago um, for the students to understand the complexity of free speech issues. Um, and I would like to see that be made available much more broadly in the same way that I would like to see the history of equality um, taught in a much fuller and more direct way uh, in high schools and in colleges than it is today. I mean, I think these are the kinds of issues that we need to be understanding and addressing um, in order to have citizens going forward who are able to make more thoughtful, more informed judgments about how they should think about the challenges that face our society. I'll take that as a closing note. I hear sort of sober assessment of the challenges of the century to come, but hope that we have within our means the ability to build a, a country that can that can meet them. Um, uh, uh, Jeff is an incredibly prolific author, but two of his most recent books are The Free Speech Century with Lee Bollinger, uh, also a, a very important First Amendment scholar, and Democracy and Equality, The Enduring Constitutional Vision of the Warren Court with David Strauss. And then coming out next year will be National Security, Leaks, and Freedom of the Press, also with Lee Bollinger. You and Lee Bollinger are like the John Lennon and Paul McCartney of free speech, kind of pre-White Album. So I hope- We law clerks at the Supreme Court at the same time. And so we've been, we've been colleagues and friends for- almost half a century now. Fantastic. We'll have to get you both on sometime and fi find the true points of disagreement that I know are lurking, lurking between you both. And uh, you could also follow Jeff uh, uh, on Twitter at stone underscore Jeffrey. Um, and as always, we'll send you these resources after the show. But Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.
All right, everyone, before we go, I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up on Vision. We'll have a trio of shows extending these topics. So next week, July 2nd, Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University, and Suzanne Nossel, the head of PEN America, will talk more about campuses uh, and free expression. On July 9th, uh, University of Miami law professor Marianne Franks will talk about online speech. She's one of the leading authorities on thinking about uh, uh, harm in online speech. Uh, and on July 16th, uh, American media and technology lawyer Nabia Syed, who uh, will come on to talk both about uh, online speech, but also about freedom of the press in a digital era. Uh, as a reminder, this episode will be up on the website tomorrow. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash vision. Please stay for 30 seconds to take the two question survey that just popped up. And as always, we will end the show to the sounds of Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. You can check out his music on Spotify. Until next week, stay safe.